arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Lord, we thank you for your word. Pray that you'll bless the preaching of it now in Jesus' name. Amen. You could be seated. Now, if you would turn to Luke chapter 11. You might mark that place so we can come back to it. We might, may or may not. Who, who knows? Who knoweth if I'll come back to that chapter or not? Luke chapter 11. Now look at, uh, we'll just, I'll just read uh, verse 29 through 32. Luke 11, starting in verse 29. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas... And of course, that's the same as Jonah. As Jonas was uh, a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came to the utmost part of the earth to hear the wisdom of, Sol of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So uh, what a great passage, and Jesus uses this to talk about, and I think he did two times, uh, because even like in Luke right here, there's two different accounts of him talking about uh, about this story. We'll, we'll look at that more in later, but I think maybe he used this story on several occasions about Nineveh. And one of the big things that he said is, and he even says the same thing about Sodom. He's like, look, you know, this generation right here, you know, you're going to, this generation is going to rise up in the judgment, right? The last day they're going to come up before God and they're going to condemn you because, you know, that whole nation repented you know, Sodom didn't, but that's another story. They repented because at the preaching that they heard in their day. And he's like, hey, you've got the Son of God right here. You've got Jesus, and he's preaching, and you're not believing him. And so, so that's going to be great judgment upon you. And he uses Nineveh in that way. Well, let's give a quick background of the story of, uh, of Jonah. And most people are familiar with this. If you've been in church any length of time, Particularly if you were in church as a kid, you no doubt heard the story of Jonah. That's a very popular one. Vacation Bible schools and such. And uh, maybe you even went to uh, a production. I don't know if you've ever been there, but we went to a Sight and Sound one time and saw the production of Jonah. No, we didn't see Jonah, but there is one that people have talked about. We, we saw a video of it, uh, but we saw actually Moses at Sight and Sound. But they have a production of Jonah because it's such a great story to tell. So they, they bring out all these, uh, uh, you know, these, these different actors and, 
and or performers or whatever, and they try to retell the story. They take a lot of liberty, of course, any of those productions to kind of change the story a little bit. But in a nutshell, we all understand what the story was about. Jonah is told to go preach the gospel to Nineveh. That was the, the one of their enemies, and it was a wicked nation, lots of violence, uh, you know, just all kinds of wickedness. I mean, you can look around at our world today, and you can see... A lot of wickedness going on. You say, hey, God, when's God going to judge the wickedness? Well, I feel like he is in some cases. Uh, and obviously there's a great day coming. We understand where he's going to destroy the world by fire. Uh, but Jonah is told to preach to that city. And of course, we understand that he's like, hey, I don't like the Ninevites. Why would I go warn them that God's going to destroy them? If I warn them, they might repent, and then God will have mercy on them because God's such a merciful God. And he's like, I would rather not tell them. And so he decides to run away from God, which is a stupid thing to do. <laughs> You can't run from God. There's nowhere you can hide. The Bible says you couldn't even go to hell and be and get away from God. He's everywhere. Right? He, he's there. He can, he can, he knows he's he's part of what's going on there. He's he's everywhere. Okay, and so you can't run from God. You can't hide from God. You think you can hide from, from people. Be sure your sins will find you out, right? Because God is 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 everywhere present. So Jonah, and he, I think surely Jonah knows that. But he's thinking, I, I can't go to Nineveh. I'm going to go the opposite direction and just hopefully God will, you know, will just destroy that city and be done with it. So he gets on a ship headed towards Tarshish and some people on the ship, you know, they've got other gods and everything, but they take him in and a big storm comes to where it's going to just destroy the ship uh, and everyone's going to die. You find Jonah in the bottom of the ship, which uh, we were talk I was talking with uh, Brother Dean about this and, and uh, it's a great illustration i think most people when they read that think about jesus when jesus the you know the storm is going on and jesus is asleep in the in the ship and it's interesting i don't have time in this message to develop it but if you think about it there are a lot of similarities to uh to jonah well i'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute uh and jesus there's a lot of old testament characters that point to jesus they're a picture of jesus now obviously any human example is going to be a bad example in the sense that we can never compare it to Jesus, but there's little little bits and pieces of uh, uh, of people in the Old Testament that are a picture of Jesus, which is, you know, which is a great analogy because Jesus became sin for us, right? So even though Jesus was without sin, he be, he took on sinful flesh and he died on the cross and became sin for us and took our place. And so it reminds me kind of like the when uh, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, it's like a brazen serpent on a stick, right? And he lifts it up, and anyone that looked at that was healed. And you're like, well, why would he use a serpent? A serpent, you think about Satan, you think about sin, and exactly, Jesus became sin for us, and it was a picture. When they looked at that serpent on the stick, God, you know, by their faith, healed them like he said he was going to. The same is true of Jesus Christ. When, when he's preached and he's lifted up, we all those who will look on him and put their faith in in that you know they can be saved from their sins and so uh so it's a great analogy in the old testament where we can go back and we can say hey this was a great picture of jesus okay so so uh jonah it doesn't know he's being an example he doesn't know that one day we're all going to be reading this and say hey don't be a jonah <laughs> he's going to be used as a bad example but it's true it's recorded this is what he did he, he uh, uh so in the middle of the storm they wake him up and they say hey pray to your gods what are you doing sleeping like we're about to die we're all praying to our gods you know pray to your god and jonah just knows hey this is god judging me he tells him you know you want this storm to stop you're just gonna have to throw me overboard and it'll stop okay so they try not to. They're like, no, 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 no. We'll, you know, they're just throwing other stuff overboard. They're like, we're going to do everything we can. Even these heathen, right? They believe in a different God, but they're like, we're not going to throw you overboard. We're not those kinds of people. And so they're doing everything they can to stop. And eventually he says, no, look, you got to throw. I don't know why he didn't just jump over. I guess he couldn't bring himself to do it, but he's like, you got to throw me overboard. You got to throw me overboard. And so they do it. They throw him overboard and he just assumes that he's dead, right? I'm going to die. In fact, let me just read this. This isn't part of the message, but uh, this is kind of a belief I have that is different than a lot of people. And so I just want to explain it. Okay. A lot of times that's dangerous. If you have a belief that's different from the, <laughs> the average person that you got to be careful. Sometimes you're, you may be a teetering on heresy or something, but I don't believe that to be the case. Uh, but I want to just show you this. Here's what I think happens. Okay. Real quickly, not to preach a whole message on this subject, but here's what a lot of people say. They say, man, Jonah was so stubborn that here he's thrown into the sea He's swallowed by a whale, 
right? Verse 17 of chapter 1, Jonah 1, 17 says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish, and Jesus said, Well, right? But here's the thing. People get freaked out about that, and they're like, It's a whale. And other people will be like, Well, a whale's not a fish. You know, well, what's the answer? Was it a fish or was it a whale? And they'll say, Ah, oh, there's a discrepancy. Here's the thing. It's a big fish, and in those days they called big fish whales. <laughs> And honestly, I don't even know it was a big fish. It could have been a big sea monster. It could have been a dinosaur. Who knows? <laughs> All right? They just called these sea creatures that were really giant, they called them whale. You know, you ever heard of, it's a whale of a tail, right? It just means it's really big. That's just where the word came from. And eventually they called what we know today whales, which are mammals, right? They called those whales. But in this case, it was just a big, who knows what he meant? Maybe it was a whale. Maybe, you know, who, care, who, know, who knows and who cares, really? Some big creature that God had prepared, uh, was there waiting for him. Maybe it was a different thing that doesn't even exist today, but God allowed it to be there to swallow up Jonah, right? But here's what people will say. They'll say, so he's so stubborn that he waits three days in the belly of the whale before he prays to God. Because that's what it says. It says he was there three days and three nights. Now chapter two. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. And people will say, see, he waited three days to pray. And they'll say, like, he spent those three days in the belly of the whale. And they say, like, you know, it talks about seaweed. And so they're like, well, inside the whale's belly, there was all this seaweed and it wrapped around him. And then he talks about the bars of hell. They say, well, maybe that was the ribs or, or who knows what, you know, and they, and they try to make that fit. But here's what I'm, here's, here's my take on this story, just from reading it and just taking it as it says, I want to submit to you this. Again, not really important to the story, but it's an opportunity for me to share this with you. Okay. I wanted to take, I want to submit this idea to you. What we have recorded here are two prayers. Okay. What do you mean, two prayers? Well, look what he says. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. Right. So this is three days later. But let's see what his prayer is. His prayer is this. And he said, I cried, that's past tense by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me, all, uh, compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward the holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul, and the depths closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I don't think he's in the whale's belly when he's saying when he's when he's saying this prayer. Okay, but when he says, uh, "I'm going to keep reading in a minute," I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm hoping that you understand what I'm saying. I think that he's praying right now, and in his prayer, he's talking about that time that he prayed after he was cast into the sea. So he's talking about the sea right now. He's not even talking about the whale. And he says, "I went down to the bottoms of the mountains." The earth with her bars was about me forever, yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the, the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pray that thou that, uh, that, that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Okay, so right as he says this prayer, the whale vomits him up on the, into dry land. And obviously he's around the place where Nineveh is, a day's journey, whatever, but he, or three days journey. But he, actually I think it's saying Nineveh is three days journey is long, I think is the context there. But he, he vomits up J Jonah onto that land. So what happened? between him spitting that up and, and, uh, and when he was swallowed from the whale, well, apparently the whale was swimming around for three days, okay? But when Jonah said his prayer that he's talking about in this prayer, right before he spit up, he's saying, you know, I, you know, called out to the Lord and he saved me. Now, when did he cry out to the Lord? Well, he's going to the bottom of the mountains. There's seaweed about him. There's talking about the bars of hell. And he's like, you know what? I'm dead. He's, he's saying he's fainting. He's, he's getting ready to faint, right? He's fainting with him. I think that Jonah literally went unconscious. And, he, and right before he went unconscious, he was praying to God. 
And I believe God allowed him to stay in an in a unconscious state while, he is, while a, the whale went and swallowed him up and then transported him. I think for three days and three nights, he was basically unconscious. Now, some people go so far as to say, just like Jesus said, hey, as Jonah was three days, three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Some people will actually take it so far as to say, I believe Jonah's soul went to hell during those three days, you know, and then it went back. I don't believe that necessarily. I'm just saying that, uh, that for those three days, we don't really know what happened. But I believe after he prayed, you know, he was unconscious. For all he knew, you know, probably he died. Right? And, then, and then when he comes back to life, he's thinking, wow, God has kept me alive. Maybe he figured out he's in the, he's in the uh, fish at that time or whatever, and then he spit him out. Now, none of that has anything to do with this, this message, but I just in case I say something that leads that route, that's the way I understand it whenever I read the story. And if you notice anything in there that is, disagrees with that, I'd be happy to talk about it afterwards. It'd be a fun conversation. But this is the story, and obviously we know that then Jonah is in his right mind to some degree and says, you know what, I can't run from God. So he goes about the city and he preaches and lots of people get saved, right? Or at least if not spiritually saved, uh, at least the nation is saved, right? There's a physical salvation there for sure. But Jonah almost said Noah. Jonah is upset about it because God spares these people and he's so mad because he wanted them to be destroyed because they're his enemies and he's like, this is why I didn't want to go there because I knew you were a God of mercy and I knew that you would spare them. And he's upset about it. Okay. And that's kind of how the story ends. Now, uh, we already read uh, Luke 11. Let's go back there. And I'll start the preaching here in a minute. Luke 11. And I wanted you to notice what he says in, uh, in verse 30. He says, For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. So this is an interesting, uh, interesting way that he phrases this. He's saying that Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites. Okay, and he's saying in that same way that he was assigned to the Ninevites, Jesus is going to be assigned to that generation that Jesus was living in, and he's going to be assigned unto them. Okay, so let's uh, break this down in three parts. Okay, number one, uh, in the title of the message, I don't think I said that was the sign of Jonas the prophet. Okay, number one, let's talk about seeking a sign. Seeking a sign. Look, if you've been around any like Pentecostal charismatic type uh, uh, churches, or they will call it spirit empowered or whatever. There's lots of different things that they'll say. You'll notice they're always seeking a sign. You know, you, they don't believe you're saved unless you had an experience where you spoke in tongues or something like that. And they want to see the power. Hey, the Holy Spirit's not moving unless somebody gets up and runs around the church or, or somebody's healed of their disease or something like that. That's a very uh, standard you know, charismatic uh, feeling. Now, some people say, well, that's how the disciples were. So there's just been a group of people that always believed that from the time of the disciples. Not true. For many, many years, nobody believed that we were still having those signs. Uh, but what happened is uh, when the, uh, the holiness movement started in the, day, the days of, West, of the Wesleys, uh, they started having these revival type meetings. Interesting, Baptists have these same types of, of revival meetings where they preach and they call everyone down to the altar and they pray and they fast and they're asking for holiness and all that. That actually stems right from the holiness movement. I'm not saying it's all entirely wrong. I'm just saying that's where they get that idea. It's from the preaching of John Wesley and guys like that who, hey, they preach some good messages, but a lot of it, there was an emph emphasis on this extra spiritual thing that eventually people took to the next level and said, you know what, if we pray and we fast, God will allow us to do some signs and wonders and then everybody will believe the gospel. And so they relied on Acts, on the, the Pentecost, you know, the day of Pentecost and the events that took place there. And they said, hey, if the Spirit's moving, this is what we'll do. We'll speak in tongues. And they got to define what speaking in tongues means, right? Hey, just speak gibberish. And they'll be like, ah, 
He spoke in tongues. Did you hear him? It's a sign, right? And so, so anyway, what I'm saying is that there are people today that are still kind of have this idea like, well, I believe in God, you know, if I have a sign. You know, God, send me a sign. If you want me to do this, send me a sign, you know. And then God will send a sign and they'll be like, well, I just don't think that was actually a sign. I mean, uh, will you send me a sign? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so they're always like seeking something. Uh, but I want you to see this. Uh, in, uh, in, in this passage where Jesus is talking, we don't see it in Luke 11 so much, but, but Jesus is speaking to a Jewish audience. Okay, Now look at Matthew chapter 12, and you'll see this for sure. Not only Jewish audience, but he's talking primarily to Pharisees. All right, Matthew chapter 12. Same story, just a different uh, gospel account. Matthew 12, look at verse uh, 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master. Hey, anytime the scribes and the Pharisees are hanging around Jesus and they're like, Master. They're getting ready to try to trip him, trip him up. They want to trick him. They're not really trying to ask him something that's going to edify them. They are trying everything they can to catch Jesus. And so these guys aren't sincere. And they say, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of Jonas, the, the, uh, uh, the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, so in that text, you get to see clearly he's got a Jewish audience that he's talking to. Now, this is significant. The fact that it's a Jewish audience is significant to this, the point of this message and to understanding what is going on in this, this uh, idea. Because we want to see why did Jesus say, you know, hey, and he, 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 this generation will see a sign, and the sign is that of Jonas the prophet, as, as he was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Why did he say all that? And what can we take from that? Well, first of all, you have to understand that he was talking to a Jewish audience, particularly to the scribes and the Pharisees that didn't even believe in him. Okay, and so this is important why he was saying that. Now, elsewhere, look at Mark chapter 8. So you're in Matthew, go one book to the right to the book of Mark, and look at chapter 8. And uh, we'll look at a few passages of Scripture here about seeking a sign. Matthew 8 and verse 11. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall no sign be given unto you, uh, be given unto this generation. Now in this passage, he doesn't mention Jonah. Okay, we don't see we don't see a mention of that. But what we do see is they say, hey, will you show us a sign? And Jesus is like, ah. you see, sighing, not out loud necessarily, but in his spirit. He's like, ah, why do you seek a sign for me? Why do you seek a sign for me? Now, why is it that Jesus would get frustrated by somebody seeking a sign? I'll tell you why, because it's not faith. Jesus wants us to have faith in a person that's like, well, you know, I'll believe if you show me a sign. That's not faith. They want to see. And faith is based on what you don't see, right? That's the evidence of things not seen. And so, uh, and so when they're seeking a sign, that is actually a frustration to Jesus. Now, Paul talks about this a little bit, this idea of seeking a sign. Look at 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter one and verse 22. Uh, let me see, maybe we should back up. Let's go with verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of uh, wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in wisdom, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. 
Okay, it doesn't mean require in the sense that, hey, a Jew is not going to get saved. I've heard people use this verse to say some weird doctrines, okay? It doesn't mean that if a Jew never, it doesn't see a sign, they're not going to get saved. It's just saying that this is what they want. This is what they desire. They're not, they don't want to believe unless they see a sign. Okay, that was the, the typical observation of Paul as he's going around preaching to the Jews. Okay, he says they require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now look at Acts chapter 17. Back uh, to the left a little bit. Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16, it says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, what, what country is Athens in? Greece. Okay, so we're talking about Greeks. His spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogues with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the markets daily. Uh, so, you know, he went to the synagogues where the Jews were, but then also he went in the markets daily with certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Poets encountered him. And some said, what will this Baptist say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods. Because he preached in them Jesus and the resurrection. That's where they all met to, uh, to have these conversations, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, what, therefore, what these things mean. Look at the next verse. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So you get this idea from the Greeks, and history tells us about the Greeks, that they were really into education. They were really into knowing things and figuring things out. And they sought after wisdom, and they wanted to know, they believed some weird things and had some weird mythological kind of ideas. Uh, but the thing is that they sought out wisdom, and they didn't need to see signs. They just, they just had these weird ideas, and they would believe them. And so Paul is saying... You know, hey, the Jews that I've talked to are all like, well, we need to see a sign. Well, how about this? And they're saying, well, Jesus rose from the dead. They're like, how do you know that was the Messiah? I mean, where's the sign? And they're looking for some kind of physical evidence. And then he talks about the Greeks. His experience is, you know, they're always seeking for wisdom and trying to like, you know, talk about, you know, these different uh, ideas and, and all this kind of stuff. So these are the kind of people we talk to today. It's two different types of people. But when Jesus tells the Pharisees, about this sign about Jonas the pro the prophet, he he what he what he's talking about. If you think about it, it makes sense because Jesus is using a story of something that was assigned to the Gentiles. Nineveh's the Ninevites were Gentiles, right? So Jonah didn't want to go there because they were Gentiles. You know, he wanted the Jews to be only God's people. Don't save those people; they're wicked. They're you know they're bad people. Just save the Jews. And God's like, no, I want you to go and tell them to repent, you know, because they're doing all this wickedness and I'm going to destroy that city if the, if the city doesn't stop doing their wicked, wicked works. Okay. <clears throat> and so the story makes sense now because now you have Jews that are all about, you know, the Jews and God's people and forget about the rest of the world. And they're coming to Jesus trying to trip him up and they don't believe in him. They're not trusting in him. And they're asking, well, show us a sign and all this. And he's like, you know what? The sign that you need is the same sign that the Ninevites had where Jonah preached and said, you know, if you're going to be destroyed if you just continue the way that you're going. And Jesus is turning that on the Pharisees and saying, look, if you just continue in your unbelief and your wickedness and everything, you are going to be destroyed. And it's really the same message that Jonah was preaching. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, so here's what uh, what here's what happens. Okay, so uh, let's talk about point two now. So we talk about seeking of a sign. Now receiving the sign. Okay, obviously the Lord throughout history has used signs. All right, on the day of Pentecost, yes, it was a sign when they spoke in tongues. People came from all nations, you know, to worship at the temple and so they had a jewish belief system but they were there at the temple and the men of god there the uh, the men and women i guess but the the ones that were the disciples of christ they began to speak in these tongues that everybody understood in their own language now it wasn't just gibberish 
you know, you ever watch these guys that claim to speak in tongues? Nobody knows what they're saying. So they don't want to question it. So they're just like, oh yeah, that's a sign from God. It's gibberish. They, they're probably just making it up. And they might not even necessarily be lying. They might just think, if I just relax myself and just say the first thing that comes to mind, uh, you know, then that's actually God speaking through me. They might think that they're doing that, but really they're just speaking gibberish. It doesn't mean anything to me. It certainly doesn't mean to me that somebody's saved if they start speaking that way. How am I going to know if they're saved? I need to know if they believe in Jesus Christ or not. <laughs> I don't care about the outward sign. I just need to know what they're saying about their belief, right? It doesn't have to do with, uh, with the signs, okay? So anyway, John, uh, uh, John 20 says this. You don't have to turn there. Many people have received signs as evidence of the truth and all, but Jesus wants us to believe without the signs. The signs are there. But Jesus wants us to believe without the signs. You remember when T Thomas, uh, they call him Doubting Thomas, right? Because every time he's mentioned, it seems like there's some kind of a doubtful attitude that he has. And Jesus rises from the dead, and they try to tell Thomas about that. And Thomas like, I'm not buying it. He's like, I'm not going to believe it until I see Jesus' hands. And I put my hand into his side, and I see the prints in his hands and all that. And so whenever he sees Whenever Thomas sees Jesus, he's like, oh, my Lord and my God. He's like, you know, he feels pretty stupid about it. But he believes him now because he sees him with his own eyes. And so here's what Jesus says. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. So it's very important that to Jesus, to God, that we believe not just because we see, but because we just know that it is true. Okay, uh, uh, the Bible says in Hebrews, of course, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can't just like, well, I'm waiting for a sign. I'm waiting for some proof. I'm waiting for some evidence. You have to believe the written record that God has given us by the prophets of God, right? This, Jonah was a prophet. All these were given to us from the prophets, and we read that, and we believe it just like Nineveh believed uh, the, the uh, Noah. I mean, <laughs> I said Noah again. Uh, Jonah. Okay. Now look at John 4. John 4. I know it's a little bit of a Bible study. We're flipping around a lot, but just try your best to follow along here. John chapter 4, look at verse 43. Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Then, when he, when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went uh, unto the feast. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee. This is the second time he went in there, where he, ha where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Ju Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, or else, uh, or come down ere my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was, uh, was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when, the, when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. I got an idea he already knew what, what time <laughs> his son was healed, but he just wanted to hear it so he could rejoice about, Man, God is good. And, you know, I knew that, that, that he, was, he was telling the truth. I didn't have to see it. I just believed him. I took him at his word. And, uh, and then he saw great things happen because of his belief. But it was funny that God first said to him, Jesus first said to him, he said, hey, you know, you only, you're not going to believe unless you see it. And he said, no, you know, come, I, I, just, I just need you to heal my son. Come heal my son. And he's like, go thy way. Thy son's already healed. Why didn't he go with him? Because he wanted that guy to turn around and in faith say, hey, when I get home, my son's going to be healed, right? It was about, about believing. It wasn't about seeing. He just, he just had to believe. And, uh, and so this is very important to God. Now to the unbelieving Jews, all right, the unbelieving Jews, their hearts were hardened. And here's the deal. The Bible makes this clear. You can look at it, John 12. Uh, in fact, let's just go ahead and go there. Why not? We're already in John. 
John chapter 12, verse 37. Now this is, we're talking about unbelieving Jews now, okay? Those who have already rejected Jesus. And this is important to uh, where I'm going here. John chapter 12, verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on, on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which is spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord uh, been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that, as Isaiah has said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted and I should heal them. And these things said Isaiah when he was uh, when he saw his glory and spake of him. Okay, so this verse is saying these people who these unbelieving Jews who re, they've already heard, they've already seen Jesus, they've heard about Jesus, but they chose to reject that. He says, you know what? I just blinded their eyes and I hardened their hearts. And they, I mean, they've already hardened their hearts, but now I'm just going to make it final. And he turns them over to reprobate mind, which is what Romans talks about. And many other places in the Bible confirms that. And he, and he says, you know what? I'm done with these people. They already hardened their heart. They don't want to believe me. Even if they saw signs, here's the bottom line. Even if they saw the signs and the miracles, they wouldn't believe. Okay. Uh, in Luke, after, uh, uh, you know, the story Jesus tells uh, about, the, about Lazarus and the, and the rich man. And uh, Lazarus goes down, uh, I mean, sorry, Lazarus goes to heaven and the rich man goes to hell. And, uh, and it talks about this dialogue that he has with Abraham. And he's like, hey, you know, I don't want to be in hell. And he's like, I don't want my family to come here. And he's like, well, you just go and send Lazarus and, and, and just give them, just uh, uh, tell my brothers, you know, about this so that they won't come to this place. And he's like, hey, you know, they're not going to believe it. He's like, yeah, but if someone came from the dead, like they know Lazarus is dead. If, if they saw him come from the dead and he actually came and he preached to them, they would believe. And Jesus says, they have Moses and the prophets. If they don't believe them, they're not going to believe if somebody raises from the dead. And that was so prophetic because what happened? Jesus raised from the dead. And guess who, guess who believed in him whenever he raised from the dead? Those who already <laughs> were believers. We're like, hey, Jesus, you know, Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15, it says he goes and he shows himself to the disciples and he shows himself to all the brethren. And so he's showing himself to people that already believe. You know, if he showed himself to the Pharisees, they'd be like, ah, you guys pulled some kind of trick here. <laughs> They're not going to believe anyway. And so really, if you think about it, that really tells us how we ought to feel about signs and miracles and wonders and, and wanting to see these things. Because if you're either going to believe or you're not going to believe, you know, and you don't really need the sign. Okay, so what was the meaning of the sign? And here's just the conclusion of it. Okay, so I believe the main application uh, that Jesus is talking about when it comes to the sign of Jonas is this. Just like Jonah said to the Ninevites, like judgment day is coming, basically, you know, judgment day is coming. This is what Jesus is telling the, the Pharisees. He's like, hey, judgment day is coming. And I will leave you with that, okay? And then he also says, uh, you know, oh, 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 and by the way, like the 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 uh, Ninevites had very little, by way of evidence, they had very little proof that God was going to destroy the city. All they had was this man that was just going around preaching. Now the argument could be made, and and again. What was the sign? You know, jo the, what was the sign of Jonas? Well, just as Jonas was three days and three nights in the in the belly of a whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Okay. Well, Jonah, Jonah, when he went to preach, okay, after the second time, and he spit out in the Nineveh, and he goes and he preaches the gospel. There's probably some little bit of evidence to his story. You know, hey, who is this man? Why does he smell so bad? <laughs> Why are his clothes like just, just like so nasty? And, and, you know, I would suspect that, that Jonah, and I think I keep saying Noah, if I do, sorry, you know, I mean, Jonah, I would suspect that Jonah probably told the story and said, look, I didn't even want to tell you this. I tried to run away from you and I got thrown in the, in the sea and I've been in a whale's belly for three days. 
And some of them probably were like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> you know, God wanted you to come here and tell us that, and he allowed you to be swallowed by a whale. But you know what? The, those people who in their heart, they've hardened their heart, they don't want to believe that would be, you know what they would say? You can't get swallowed by a whale. Nobody's ever been swallowed by a whale. Do you know the what size of a whale's stomach? You know, the people that make those kind of arguments, if you try to talk about Jonah and the whale, they're like, I don't believe that, right? And hey, what did I say at the beginning of the story? Like, I, I don't even think it was necessarily a whale. It was just a giant fish. God prepared. I don't know. I don't really care. Like, I don't need proof. I don't need it to show some kind of uh, 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 fossils record of this animal that had a huge stomach that would hold, you know, I don't need to see like Pinocchio type whale that a ship could see be inside. <laughs> you know, I don't need to see that. I've got the word of God. He was swallowed by something that God prepared. You know, and this is how the Ninevites, they were like, wow, man, yeah, I think you're probably telling the truth. I mean, after all, I mean, you, you, you actually, you do stink and, you know, you do look like maybe you've been in the belly. Well, I'll just take your word for it, right? And so Jesus is saying, just like that, he's telling him, here's the sign that you get. Okay, you want these signs and you want these wonders. Here's the sign that you get. Now, again, he did miracles, you know, but a lot of people didn't believe his miracles anyway. But he's telling the Pharisees, like, here's the sign you get. I'm going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, right? And when I rise again, you know, that's it. This is, from that point on, it's like, hey, you know, you trust, uh, you, whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved, right? And who, and, and with the heart, man believes in the right, now how's it say, uh, 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 let's go to Romans 10 before I mess it up. I will quote this like so many times every time we go soul winning, but it would be better to read it. Romans 10. All right. Well, how does somebody get saved? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Look, I just it's just not that easy. You can't just believe that Jesus died and was buried and he rose again the third day and that's going to be and that's going to save you. No, no, no. You got to do the works and you got to be really good and you got to do all this and there's got to be sign, there's got to be evidence that the person's life changed and they're all that kind of stuff. Man, you're just as wicked as the Pharisees if you believe that. Cuz that's not what the gospel is. The gospel is are you going to believe that Jesus died for your sins and paid that price or are you not going to believe it? Are you going to believe that he died and, and was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and then he rose again the third day? Are you going to believe that? Or are you going to be like, well, I believe some of the Bible, but I just don't know about others. Well, then you don't believe, okay? You believe God or you don't believe God. And God said that the Son of Man came, he gave his life for you, he died, was buried, he rose again the third day, and all who believe that and call on him will be saved. You're going to believe it or you're not going to believe it. And this, is a, and this is a good application as to what Jesus was saying. So the men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation. He's talking about those people who were sitting there witnessing Jesus. And he's like, uh, you know, I'm going to die. Three days later, I'm going to rise again. And some of you all are still going to reject that. And he said, this generation, uh, uh, Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. What we can learn from this as well as saved people, okay? Now, that would be an illustration. What I set up to this point could be an illustration for unsaved people. Hey, you just need to put your faith in it. Don't worry about signs and wonders and all that kind of stuff. But what about saved people? What uh, can we get from that? Well, one thing to remember is we don't need a sign in order to, to believe in even the power of God, right? Again, I, you know, we weren't, we weren't three months into this work before somebody started saying, you know, I just don't think these people are really getting saved. Well, what do you mean? Why aren't they getting saved? You mean, are you waiting to see like their lives change and do good? No, 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 no. I think that when they get saved, there should be some kind of a spiritual evidence, uh, you know, because the Bible says, and he took us to John 3 and said, you know, the wind, and, and he says, uh, you know, the, the wind uh, uh, moveth where it listeth or, or whatever. And, and, uh, and he's like, so I think that when a person gets saved, there's going to be this experience and there's going to be this wind. And he's like, he's like, I know it because that's what happened to me. And he left out the part that he was on drugs when it happened. 
I'm, and I'm serious about that. He left out that part, and he says, like, everybody ought to do that. And if they don't do this, I don't believe they got saved because there has to be this, this sign. And I'm like, you sound just like the Pentecostals. Like, hey, if you don't speak in tongues, if you're not slain in the Spirit or whatever, depending on the church, you know, what they teach, if that didn't happen to you, you didn't get saved. Look, as Christians, forget that. That's not, don't, don't listen to that garbage that there has to be a sign, right? We, uh, we aren't worried about the signs and the wonders. In fact, I, this is one of my, the most, to me, one of the most powerful, the powerful proofs that we're not supposed to be looking for signs and wonders today. You're not supposed to be looking for that man who can heal and the guy that can speak in tongues and all that. You say, how do you know? Because the Bible talks, Jesus talked about signs and wonders in, in Matthew 23, and he was talking about the Antichrist. And he said, you know what? Somebody's going to come and they're going to do signs and wonders and they're going to deceive, if possible, the very elect. And he's like, don't believe them. And you read in Revelation, you read about the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet, and you see that they're doing these signs and wonders, and through their signs and wonders, they're able to deceive all these people into following him. And so what that tells me as a Christian is, if somebody says, you know, you got to believe this guy because he's doing all these signs and wonders, that makes me not want to believe him. <laughs> because literally, like the next person we're supposed to be looking for that does signs and wonders is the Antichrist and the false prophet. And so, so I just disregard all that charismatic mumbo jumbo where they're just like, hey, you know, speaking in tongues and healing. And they claim that they've gone into hospitals and raised people out of the dead, even though there's no records, no written records or anything like that. You know, now if the Bible said that you know, we would still be doing that today, then I'd be like, oh, hey, well, then if Jesus said it, then he says it. But there's a lot of evidence through the preaching of Paul and, and everything that there's no reason to believe that that continued to happen after we got a more sure word of prophecy. Right in the Bible, we got the Bible. We don't need to see the signs and wonders because the signs and wonders are right here. We just have to believe it. And if we believe it in here and forget about what we see with our eyes, then that's way more blessed than those who only believe what they see. You know, in fact, if you only believe what you see, again, are you really believing at all? You know, because what he wants us to do is just to believe. So when it comes to preaching the gospel, here's what we're to do we go forth into the world you know the bible talks about with weeping bearing precious seed and we go and we deliver the message just like jonah delivered the message now he didn't want people to get saved we want people to get saved okay but we go deliver the message and we tell folks that they just need to trust jesus the one who died and was buried and rose again the third day put their trust in him for their salvation and then we just keep on going you know what i mean if there's like hey you know i gotta see the signs okay well then have a nice day and I'm going to go to the next person because all I want them to do is just trust what they heard and to trust it by faith to the world because they want to see the signs and the wonders. Uh, but we believe God and it's more blessed to, uh, uh, to, to believe by faith and not by sight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. And even though there's much things that are confusing and there's much deception out there, and it's easy to misunderstand salvation that you've provided. I pray that you'll help us just to just to take up the faith of a child and just trust you at your word and not lean on our own understanding and not seek uh, any signs or, or wonders, Father. Uh, what a what a blessing to uh, to be free from all that and uh, and to just believe by faith. And Lord, when we do that, you show us uh, you give us evidence. Lord, you show us the evidence because uh, faith is a substance, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And, and I pray, Lord, that you just help us all to live by faith and to walk by, by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Well, praise the Lord.